Um, thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, I've been looking forward to, to moderating this panel for a couple reasons. I think first and foremost, we can probably all agree that cybersecurity is, is a topic that continues to, to garner uh, a fair amount of interest, significant interest from from governments, from regulators, uh, from firms such as those that you represent, as well as from your clients. So, so it's, a, it's a timely topic. Um, secondly, it's a subject that, at least from my perspective, continues to raise questions. It's such a broad subject. And, uh, you know, I think what we're trying to do, and you can see by the, by the, the title, you know, what have you done, what are you doing, and what should you do next, um, hopefully going to, to, to get to some of the practical applications so you can start to see what your peers are doing, you can start to understand uh, some of the things you can take back to your firm and the risks that you should be looking at. And, and really, uh, the, the, the other reason why I've been looking forward to this panel is just, you know, I think we've got a great set of panelists here with some, some broad experiences that, that they'll be able to share with you. So with that, uh, we'll just go down the line, starting with Alex, just introduce themselves. Sure. So, my name's Alex Brown, I'm a partner at Simmons and Simmons, uh, which is a law firm. I'm a technology and outsourcing lawyer, and I head up the firm's data protection and privacy practice. My name's James Hogben, I run a company called IP Sentinel, and I work closely with Cordium on um, cybersecurity, data protection, and IT as it faces off against the regulators. And my name's Connor Kiernan, I'm the CTO of a UK headquartered long short equity fund called Marshall Waste. Very much a, a build over buy shop, so a large proprietary application in the technology estate. Okay. Um, to, to get things started, I thought, you know, I'd just give a, a, a brief overview of what we have been seeing in the US in terms of really regulatory uh, focus on, on the topic of cybersecurity. And, and I think really just three categories of, of what we've seen. Uh, first and foremost, there have been uh, communications and setting of expectations. So that starts out going back at least two years with regulatory priorities from FINRA, from the CFTC, from the SEC, uh, in making sure that, that the, the market and the registrants understood that this was absolute, absolutely going to be a topic uh, of focus going forward. That's something that we've seen on the priority list uh, for, for multiple years running now. Secondly, you had uh, the National Examination Program of the SEC coming out with uh, an announcement about focused exams in the cybersecurity space. So again, setting expectations, letting people, letting the, the market understand what is going to be expected, what is going to be looked for. And, and that, they even went so far, not, I wouldn't say it's unprecedented, but it's certainly interesting that they have now two times over released the questions that they will be looking for, the document request list. So what they're going to be expecting to find when they come in to conduct a cyber exam. And then some portion of that when they come in to conduct maybe a different exam, but they do focus a little bit on cybersecurity. So, so that, you know, I guess, again, that setting expectations and that explaining. Secondly, you've got the concept of testing and, and fact gathering. So for the past, 24 months, the, the, the team has been out conducting those examinations. In the first round, they looked at approximately 50 large, duly registered, SEC registered investment advisory firms and broker dealers. And I would say that one was more of a fact gathering mission. So they were going in, they were, they were asking questions, um, taking the feedback, and really trying to figure out where the market stood with respect to their cybersecurity sec preparedness and their data protection plans. The next round of exams, which is, which is ongoing, is expected to be more focused on testing. Um, so that's really the third category of what we've seen from a U.S. regulatory perspective is, is testing and, and starting to, to set the stage in terms of feedback. So I mentioned the round of exams that's going on now, and that is stepping it up. So we, we have, I've heard stories about one firm that was tested in the first round, and let's just say their, their data protection plan was not necessarily robust. Um, but that was just feedback from the regulators saying you need to do a better job. 
This time around, I think there's more expectation that there's going to be testing, and it could start to build into more of the enforcement action, which uh, we've already seen a little bit of enforcement action with the R.T. Jones case, and that one really uh, sounded, you know, I think that got everyone's attention that now we have actually enforcement action around cybersecurity plans, and, and people are taking it seriously, making sure that they've got not only their policies in place, but they're starting to get through their risk assessments, and they're starting to really build out their program. So with that focus and, and really, you know, just, just kind of giving you what I've experienced from a U.S. perspective, I think we'll, we'll open it up to the panel discussion, and we're going to try to keep this uh, moving around a little bit, so uh, you guys can feel free to jump in. But, uh, you know, from a first, for a first question for you guys is, you know, how does that approach, what I just went through from, by U.S. regulators, compare to steps that you're seeing in the U.K. and, and European, whether that's governmental or regulator, regulatory? So I, so I kick off with that. You know, I think um, from a UK perspective, I think you were seeing uh, not quite the same degree of uh, you know, publicly visible activity. So you know, it's certainly on the FCA radar, it's certainly a, a priority area for the FCA, but we haven't seen the same degree of kind of large scale action, if you like, that you, you guys have seen in the US. And I think there, a lot of their focus has been on the sort of retail investment bank sector uh, as well, um, where they have been conducting you know, scenario testing exercises and, and questioning kind of preparedness in, in that sector more. Um, but it is, in the, you know, it is in the key priorities of the FCA, so we can expect the FCA to do more in this area going forwards. And I think you also have to look at it as being aligned to the topic of IT resilience, where the FCA is also active and they've um, handed out in the not too distant past a reasonably meaty fine to, uh, to RBS and NatWest uh, because of uh, failure in IT resilience. And if you read that RBS and NatWest decision, okay, it's not a cybersecurity attack, but you can read it right across the failings identified there, which by the way, I reckon you would find in most financial institutions. Um, I think you can read across those failures into cybersecurity context as well. Mm -hmm. So failures in layers of governance, lots of reporting going on, but actually not a lot of fixing of issues, uh, a lot of keeping of issues log, but those issues logs not getting any shorter. Um, a focus on black swan events, the sort of critical outages and the things that would take down the bank, as opposed to the more likely lower level problems that, that well, were more likely to occur and would, and would cause disruption. Um, and also, then finally, the, the issue of IT resilience, and as I say, if you can read across to cybersecurity, not being given enough prominence at a, at a senior management uh, level. So, you know, a sort of failure of a sort of senior level governance as well. And I think it's a really good decision to read across and think about in the context of cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. So, at the risk of being contentious, which I very rarely am, um, the regulator, as far as we can see in the UK, doesn't take any notice of cybersecurity whatsoever. However, it's ultimately driven by the investors who turn up and say, we will do diligence, you as a, as a fund, you as an investment trust. Uh, by the way, you are cyber secure, aren't you? Because uh, if you're not, you're not having our money. And we find that the investment consultants are the ones that are driving from the business side, cybersecurity into the financial sector. Um, back to the business resilience point, um, for the last three days, uh, HBOS, uh, HSBC has been offline of uh, internet banking for a denial of service attack. And, you know, what's the FCA going to do? It's going to fine them for some script kitty in Vietnam taking them offline? I, I can't see that happening. Um, we're as opposed to the RBS NatWest where they've underinvested for generations in IT, which I think is a, a significant regulatory issue. Just to, just to add in there, I mean, I think, I think it's a little bit unfair to say that the FCA is not on their radar at all. I think it's, you're seeing it being driven by, by different industry bodies, right? In the, in the U.S., the SEC is on top of it and issuing a lot of, uh, you know, their thought, thought pieces on it and pointing to NIST and pointing to government. In the U.K., you have the government who's actually educating yeah. private business, and, and they're the ones who wrote the Dear CEO letters. They're the ones who are actually going to, to um, 
these companies that are doing due diligence and educating them on the risk so that it's driven from business. They've come forward and said, hey, listen, you know, there's no eye of Sauron. We're not here to protect you. If you want to protect your own IP and do business in the UK, then, then uh, you need to get your, your game up. And so, I, you know, do I think one is right, one is wrong, or one's been more successful? I mean, for me, I, I, even being from the US, I think I'd rather have it where it's, it's grown from the business as opposed to grown from the regulator. I think you know, when the regulator's jumping and being prescriptive and telling you what you should do, you end up doing things off a checklist. And, and when the business is actually legitimately concerned and aware about it, it grows more organically and, it, and the cult, certain culture grows. Um, and also, just to say, you know, the government in the UK is in close concert with the, the FCA, and the regulators are in close concert with each other, talking about what each other are doing. So I wouldn't say that there's not a lot of um, you know, cooperation across the pond and, and disconnection between government and, and regulators here. Yeah. I mean, James, sticking with your, your point about uh, investor-driven, uh, yep. you know, if, you, if you think about that from, a, from an institutional due diligence exercise, um, have you seen, do you have any experience in terms of, of what questions are they asking? Is it, is it akin to a service provider check, which is, which is covered under, under most, uh, you know, call them risk assessments or written information security policies? Is it that, or is it is it more? Um, you know, are they bringing in experts? Uh, it, it I, that's a great question. Some of them bring in experts, but with things like AMA and the Hedge Fund Standards Board issuing guidance on how you should include your security posture within your marketing materials, uh, funds have become much more aware of it, and the investors are coming in and want to see the processes there. It's all about process and governance because, effectively you're going to get attacked, you're going to get owned, you're going to get taken out, you can't stop it. Mm -hmm. But what an investor would like to see is, how would you fight that last war? Do you have a notifiable event process? Is it included in your ICAP? Is there an operational risk process that is aware of the fact that some script kiddie is going to come in and take you offline? Or mm -hmm. an employee is going to turn bad and email the CRM to themselves to get a better job? Um, all of which are utterly indefensible. Um, but the policy and procedure that goes around it is the bit that the due diligence companies focus on. Right. Interesting. Um, as far as, you know, the trends that you're seeing in terms of outsourcing data protection versus, versus keeping that in-house or insourcing, uh, what are you seeing in that area that, that you think the audience would be interested about? Want to take the lead there, okay. Alex? Um, well, I guess, so the first thing that I, you know, always feel compelled to say if someone is talking to me about outsourcing is that you can outsource the function, you can give someone the responsibility to do it, but what you cannot delegate, of course, is the regulatory responsibility for you know, keeping your data safe, uh, having, you know, uh, appropriately resilient systems and uh, remaining operational. So you say can't, you can't delegate that. That's always going to sit with you. So... Um, it's therefore common sense that you've got to retain an appropriate degree of oversight and control because you're retaining the responsibility and the liability. Um, and of course, the, the, the regulations say that you've got to do that. And you know, in the last couple of years, we've seen uh, the, the, the outrun of the dear CEO letter with the FCA saying, you know, there has not been enough focus uh, in this sector on people making sure that there is that appropriate oversight and control of, uh, of outsourced functions. So, um, so we're definitely seeing much more focus on that in this sector, uh, more interest in the sort of process and governance around uh, outsourcing and the, uh, and the controls around the outsourcing. So you know, the sort of due diligence exercise on the sort of vendor uh, supply chain, um, making sure there's retained expertise in the, in the business, um, proper management of the vendor uh, in life of contract. And of course, you know, lots of stuff being stacked into the contracts to, to ensure there's proper oversight and control um, and ability to exit as well, which is really, really important. Uh, so when you start a fund up, um, you're a master of the universe, you've got your trading models, you know everything about the financial world and you're a colossus. Um, the last thing you want to do is touch a computer. And so there's a, a very plausible bunch of people in suits that will turn up for a monthly fee, will take your IT off your hands for you and your archiving and your cyber security and your business resilience and all the rest of it. Um, and you pay the money. 
And the more they price, the better they must be. So therefore, you pay a lot of money. Uh, normally on a per user charge, you normally tie yourself into a five-year contract. And then you realize that the regulator actually has an opinion on how you're doing it. You get your first compliance officer in. The compliance officer goes to the senior management systems and control handbook and says, SIS 9-1, we should have all of our business critical data. Do we get that from our outsourcer? And then you go to the outsourcer, and the outsourcer goes, no, you've signed a contract. We look after your archive data. And that begins to get into dodgy territory because you have the responsibility to the regulator, yet you can't get from your delivery partner the bits and pieces that you have to give to the regulator. So the whole outsourcing model at that end needs to be examined because the contracts historically are not necessarily fit for purpose where the, the regulator's driving. Then as you grow as a business, your trading models have taken on the world, you've taken on your middle and back office staff, you've got a yard under management, you start looking at the cloud as somewhere to put all of your stuff because it's really expensive to hire nerds to get to do it in-house. So you've got it all, and, and nerds are horrible. So you've given it all to Amazon or, or Google or whatever, and all of a sudden you're into the big boy outsourcing, which is the Cisco gates of the world, where you've taken a proper business critical bit of your infrastructure, i.e. your trading system or whatever, and you've given it to some faceless pixie somewhere in some data center. And again, the regulator has an opinion on that. And we're struggling just at the minute, because one of the opinions is, uh, if you've been a bad boy in terms of regulation, the regulator would like to come and subpoena all of your stuff, carry box loads of documents out. Um, and they think that the cloud is exactly the same, and they can arrive at the cloud and somehow take your data out of it. And they require you as the individual, or you as the firm, to sign up and say to the cloud provider, by the way, we can have access at any time, because the regulator says so. And it doesn't work like that. So there is a, a consultation going on at the minute where the FCA is trying to bring some sense to the historical, we go in with the police, lock everybody up, and take all the boxes and computers into the cloud. And it, it's a little confusing as to what guidance can be issued to say, can you use Amazon or Azure for critical services with the rule set as it happens at the minute. So it is guidance that this all works, but outsourcing is something you really do need to get advice on, because right from the beginning, you can get your face well and truly ripped off versus the regulator or versus any sort of fiscal probity if you don't understand the process. And as you move through it, the devil is in the detail, because Cisgate 1 is a problematical thing for most outsourcing as you get big. Yeah. So I can just Sorry, in. you're a lawyer. Yeah. I, what, I, what do I know? <laughs> no, I mean, but I was just going to say, I think what's quite interesting now is, you know, if you, if you talk to the big cloud providers uh, 12 months ago, 18 months ago, and you said Syscate to them, and you said, well, you know, we've got to do these things, it, you know, for, for the most part, it would not compute. Audit rights? Oh, I saw what you absolutely, did there, right? yeah, <laughs> Absolutely no way. Never. Yeah. You never can, we're not even going to tell you where the data is. Um, you know, so all these requirements, it does not work for cloud computing. And you know what? You can either buy it or not buy it, because we can sell it to a million other people. We don't need it. Um, interesting shift, I think, in the last 12 months, where the big cloud providers are thinking, actually, particularly you know, in, in, the, in the larger financial institution space, they're thinking, wow, there are some big accounts out there we can get, way bigger than anything we've done before. So we're seeing people like Microsoft, people like Amazon, shifting a bit and saying, right, well, what can we do to give some limited audit rights? What can we do yep. to, to, to deal with these things? So there's quite an interesting shift happening in the market. It's not moving far enough as far as the, the FCA is <laughs> yeah. concerned, but it is moving a bit. Yeah. Just, just to add to that, I think you know, that's one thing where you're seeing a common theme between the US regulators and the FCA is um, the whole outsourcing and vendor supply chain and your due diligence in, in, within that process. And you know, the, the recent guidance on the FCA, IT outsourcing, and cloud providers, I think it had some, some great material, material in there, and Alex touched on it earlier, about you know, what are the things that you actually can do. One, you can't, you can't disavow that responsibility. So your best bet is to transfer some, some of that risk that you have to them, and, and your best hopes of doing that is really, is really through contractual provisions and strong due diligence. And the contractual provisions is something that we actually sat down and thought, long and hard about like what are those contractual provisions that you should aim for and in helping construct a response to, to, the, uh, to the FCA um, on the request for consultation with that 
you know, we, we actually spit out a big list of things that you should be asking for. And you know, I would encourage anyone who hasn't actually responded um, to look to draft a response and talk about that. Because the one thing I think that that gives the, the, the whole of this industry is teeth when we're asking for those contractual provisions to give us certain rights to if the fact that there's been a data breach for them to actually notify customers, the fact that there's a critical vulnerability in their system that they find out about, that they actually patch it with a certain service level agreement. And there's a lot of these provisions that you can actually systematically go through and check off. And if we're all asking for it, you know, all boats rise. And, and I do think that there is a worrying trend that I see that a lot of the guidance is, well, just ask good questions. Just ask everyone else around you these really good questions, and all boats will rise because of it. And you do have to go and look at yourself and look at your own IT environment and say, actually, what's my story answering these questions? Do we have a good story as a, as a compliance or legal professional within your firm? Do you understand what your IT department is doing? You know, are, are you shovel passing it to them and they're the ones who are doing the technology side of that due diligence and they're sitting there with a big stack and you don't understand what they do and they don't understand what you do. <laughs> when you're reviewing uh, contracts commercially, are you guys joining together, joining forces and talking about the things that worry you? And you know, what I found is internally we went through a, a big exercise of getting the legal and compliance team very familiar with the, the cybersecurity space and it started with and education. It started with having them read AMA's sound practices to cybersecurity, going through that, looking at all the things that are considered to be a basic, basic, basic defense that you have in place, and looking at, at our program and governance and seeing, do we tick those boxes? What's our story? Adopting the whole hedge fund standards board, ex, uh, you know, adopt or explain, uh, which I think is great to actually sit there and have a narrative for every single one of those basic concepts. And then you actually have better questions to ask you get those contractual provisions, and it's something for us all to think about. Yeah, I mean, I guess just sticking with that point a little bit, Connor, the, who else is, besides IT and legal and compliance, and you think about you know, transition to the next subject, which is, which is governance, which you brought up there, um, who else within the firm do you think is critical to, to have educated on, on the this, this cybersecurity front, and what have been some of the challenges there? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, one thing I see, certainly, I mean, ours, our education actually started at a very high level. And I think we had a convenient thing happen in, in someone senior's personal life that actually led to a whole, you know, pay attention, everybody moment. This, this stuff is real. Um, and, you know, education to our operating committee, followed by an education to the board. And we really approached it with employees, the board, and the operating committee, not as a, here's what you need to do to protect our firm and our data and the investors. It was, here's what you need to do at home to protect yourself and your family from getting pwned. <laughs> and, and we went through that whole exercise, and people were very interested and very engaged um, from that. And we actually took that page from, from Credit Suisse, who, who took the same approach when they were educating their employees. We really liked that idea, a lot of pickup. And it actually pays dividends um, back into, into your work environment, because people suddenly become security conscious. And the whole culture shifts, and people are generally aware. And then you can start introducing things like, Fishing campaigns, and we fish all employees quarterly, and everyone's subject to it. No one is above that. Right? This, the CEO, the CIO, everyone's getting these these phishing uh, emails. Everyone's going through the education in the program. So certainly that's an important thing. And in your governance structure, don't leave it purely within IT. I think you know people have a tendency to do that. In our own governance structure, we have IT, we have risk, we have operations. We report into an operations control group, reports into an operations committee, and into, into the COO. And so it's really about having a diverse group across the business who are looking at all these different verticals and, and saying, hey, isn't there, isn't there a danger there? Shouldn't we be focused on locking this up or closing this down? And meeting regularly, frequently. We meet every two weeks. And it's about keeping each other honest in terms of delivering and slowly building it up. I think one mistake that firms are making is jumping to policy first thing. So it starts in you know, the legal team drafting this, this giant document to tick off the boxes of, of ISO or NIST or, or even EMA's AMOS sound practice. And that's really the wrong first move, in my opinion. It starts with boots on the ground, that education, a cultural shift, and then building up from there. Mm -hmm. So talking about, everybody knows what phishing is, right? No, OK. So phishing is targeted emails. So people will send you an email that looks plausible, and you will take some action to it. Give a username and password, click on a link, that sort of thing. And there was uh, a COO that I'm aware of who on Friday transferred $1.3 million on the back of one of those emails. 
So somebody had broken into their organization from the CEO's mail file, worked out what the patois was and internal email, and sent to the CFO, COO, um, please transfer $1.3 million to this account. And the COO, obviously not being a master of the universe, <laughs> and wanted to be client focused, did just that. So on Friday, there is a hedge fund that lost 1.3 million to a live phishing attack. Now, there are bits and pieces you can put in place, but it's all about education. Yeah. There's no policy, there's no tool that can stop this stuff. If your employees click on the link, if your employees give the username and password out, then the battle is lost. And there's nothing from technology, there's nothing from policy that you can do that beats the education. And it's often remarkably simple uh, ruses, isn't it? I mean, yeah. I think there's an uh, assumption that this is all about, you know, uh, incredibly clever people <coughs> sitting in front of a screen, you know, hacking away. And actually, it's remarkably simple stuff. And it's playing on kind of the fact that humans are, in, you know, inherently want to trust people, yeah. right? And, know, and, and they want to trust what they see in front of them. Um, so I think, you know, that, 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 uh, that component of... Uh, making this sort of uh, making your empl employees actually just inquisitive about what they're seeing and thinking, you know, is this real? Should I should I question this? Um, I, I sort of liken it to um, the sort of airline industry where they used to have a big problem in the airline industry where you'd have quite sort of strict hierarchy and no one would question the decisions that were being made by pilots and and they, then they realised that pilots were making captains were making lots of mistakes and planes were crashing. So what they had to introduce in a lot of airlines was a culture on the flight deck of everyone's allowed to, everyone's kind of flying the plane. Everyone is allowed to question everyone. So what you want in your organization is someone saying, well, just because the, uh, the, 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 it looks like this email's come from the CEO, I'm not necessarily just going to jump. I'm just going to think about this before I do it. I think that brings up a really important point. I mean, even the firms that I look across on, on the buy side, and I say, actually, they do cybersecurity pretty well. When you, when you look under the hood, there's actually, you know, there's a, there's a sliding slope about who is allowed to do what. And, and the funny thing is I think the firm leaves that largely on technology for them to be in the middle of this problem. And the business as a whole doesn't address it. And what I mean by that is, you know, they'll have their CEO allowed to use his Gmail account and Dropbox. And, you know, as you go down the chain, depending on your importance, depends on how open, open that environment is. And you know, one, I think it would be pretty, pretty appalling if in a due diligence session, you know, someone's asking you the question, like, yeah, do these policies apply across the board? Is there any exceptions to the rule? And you have to answer that, you know, actually, you know, our COO is allowed to do, do whatever they want, and it's largely open for them. And uh, you know, it's the whole firm's problem to deal with that. It's not a technology problem. You know, it's a problem that involves legal and compliance and the COO and the CEO and the board and all of that should be surfaced and raised. And I, right now, I, I hear a lot from people in the trenches that it's all on technology, and it's a, a culture of do as you're told. It applies to everyone else but me. And that's something that everyone in this room probably plays a part in helping, helping solve culturally. OK. A uh, question from the audience, uh, as a, as a, which is, as a compliance officer considering cyber security for the first meaningful time, what are the three things I should look for or consider first? Where should they start? Um, they should probably get some help um, from uh, some backroom <laughs> nerd um, because um, it's a very broad subject. There's everything from scams, cons, please wire money, through to people embedding bits and pieces in web pages that will steal processing cycles to mine bitcoins. So. Cybersecurity is just this massive, great, big area that you're probably going to want to get some help from any number of vendors. McAfee, Symantec, all have professional services, through to some specialists in the financial industry that have services. Um, so number one, know what you're trying to hit. Uh, number two, go to your IT department and say, every computer needs to be fully patched every time a patch comes out. No excuses. In a poll of what all of the... InfoSec professionals do. Not one of them in their top five had antivirus. Firewall made it fairly low down the list. But what they all had as number one was to keep their computers patched. So apropos of nothing, when you go back to your office tomorrow, go to the IT person and say, I want to make sure every single computer in this office block is patched to the latest version. 
And it's automatic, it's free, you can get it, you can download it from Microsoft or Apple, but do it, because that is what people rely on. Um, and then thirdly, have a good think about the culture, because putting in cybersecurity changes the culture. You do have to block off Dropbox, LinkedIn, Facebook. You do have to shut down Gmail. You do have to monitor what people are doing. And that is a subtle change in the, the business from an open, free, sherry, googly world into a much more corporate, the information is segregated over here and we monitor and audit, audit it. So get some help, patch your computers, and make sure you understand what cultural changes that you're about to bring about. Okay. Um, got a polling question up here. Hopefully some people have had a chance to, to get in and answer that. Let's see if I can pull this off here. It should be 100%, right? Because everybody, <laughs> everybody has. <laughs> or else our industry's dead. Oh, wow. That's cool. Yeah, oh, rubbish. <laughs> you just don't know it. 51% don't know it. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's, that's the answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess with that, question, you know, I think, what are some of the, the practical examples that, that you guys have seen in terms of, you know, we've talked about the phishing, but, but where can things go wrong, and whether that's with the, the setup, the culture, the, the systems, you know, the lack of training, the lack of, of policy, you know, just to think about the ways, you know, I think this is an area where with just the time we have left to just talk about some of the more common things that you see and what the audience could be doing when they leave here today a little bit better. So, so if I think about all of the, so the various security breach incidents that I've advised on, I think at the heart, every single one of them has had a person either doing something stupid or doing something that they knew they shouldn't be doing. Mm -hmm. So the biggest single kind of security fail, you know, single point of failure, if you like, in the business is the people. So that's why the sort of stuff awareness training is so important, but also knowing what your people are doing and being able to kind of monitor what, what they're doing and what they're taking out of the business uh, and that sort of thing. So you know, I think if you're going to just think about one thing, I'd say really focus on the people in the organization. Mm -hmm. A lot of the breaches I've been involved in have been orthogonal. They, they weren't about breaking into the hedge fund, investment fund to steal corporate secrets or whatever. They were about hosting a porn site. They were about mining bitcoins. They were about uh, creating a botnet for a denial of service attack. So actually, you as an IT professional are trying to stop your employee who's gone bad stealing stuff. And actually, it's the bloke in accounts who's clicked on the CNN website and all of a sudden his computer's mining bitcoins mm. on your time. Mm. And that's, you know, there is the insider threat, there's the external threat, but actually it's just people trust their computers for whatever reason. And if they click on a site and it goes a bit slow, they think, oh, the computer's having an off day. <laughs> actually, no, they should be suspicious and say, I think I shouldn't have clicked on yes 18 times when it asked me if I wanted to install it. Um, and now my computer isn't working. Um, and I should tell IT that. Oh, no, I won't. I'll just click on that game. Um, so, yeah. yeah. I had a point, but I've forgotten it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, so certainly, I mean, you know, I feel that, that we have, we, you know, we do a, a reasonable job in, in cybersecurity defense, and I would, I would never, you know, say that we haven't seen incidents. I mean, we see incidents every day. And... I say incidents where we're talking about, you know, the phishing example. You're talking about the, the COO who paid $1.3 million on a transfer of an invoice. We've gotten many communications very recently in the past couple months, actually, a surge of them on, you know, fake email spoof from CEO to COO asking for transfers. I'm on the road. And this has been across the UK. Yeah. We've had, um, very rarely, we've had targeted phishing emails, spear phishing emails sent to administrators with Adobe 7 exploits. So you open up the, the PDF, and if you had Adobe 7 or less, it would just crash, and you would think nothing else. Um, and maybe something just crashed, but no, actually it downloaded a malicious payload and put it there. Now, luckily, we were patched up to recent levels on Adobe, and that, that actually didn't impact us, and no one opened it to begin with, but we, we sent it in for scanning. Um, we've been collateral damage in a, in a DDoS attack. So we get um, DNS services. When you go look up Microsoft.com, 
the actual IP address that you resolve to, you're, you're asking a service saying, you know, what, what IP address should I be going to when I'm, when I'm going here? The service that we used, one of the customers on it was, was targeted um, as a company in the DDoS attack. After an you know, unsuccessful campaign for three days on them, the DDoS attackers elevated the campaign and were sending unprecedented amount of traffic to a whole bunch of customers on a whole segment of the internet. We were one of the victims there and had to mm -hmm. fail over um, our, our external web services over to Hong Kong to, to avoid that. Now, someone else who actually wasn't paying attention to that might be sitting there thinking, oh, actually the internet's slow or it's down or you know, something's wrong with the ISP. But no, just collateral damage uh, of a DDoS attack. So you know, maybe there's plenty of you who've had those days and not even known it. Right? So um, other, other things we've had, you know, there, there have been issues with employees where there's been you know, behavior or something done that you don't necessarily want. It's not desirable. You look back on your own internal policy, and there might not be meaty enough clauses in there to actually have a disciplinary action or talk to them or, or lead to termination. And so revisiting those, those policies that people are reading and sign off, signing off on, not just as a, a, a cover your ass thing, but as an education to employees so that as they're reading through it, there's no gray line to walk. There's, there's no ambiguity there. There's no room for interpretation. This is what you can do. This is what you cannot do. If you're doing this, this is bad. Even if you're allowed to do it and technology doesn't prevent you from doing it, don't do it. Um, and you know, I think there's, there's a lot of things that we're all subject to. I agree the internet is a very dangerous place. It's probably the most dangerous place. Even stripping away administrative rights doesn't, doesn't really help <laughs> mitigate the, uh, the internet factor. I think there's some great technologies coming out down the road that we'll see in the next couple of years, but uh, it's, it's a little too soon. My advice to a compliance officer who's just starting out and is wondering what the steps to do, number one, educate yourself. And there's, as uh, was touched on by James, there's lots of free education out there. If you're an AMA member, great. Download the sound practices. Read just the bits in green. There's a nice checklist that tells you just the pages that are the interesting pages to read, or relevant if you're a small company. Read those at the very least. Ask questions of your internal IT or ask questions of your outsourced IT around those questions. Develop your own, your own story around there. And the most important thing to set up is not policy initially. I think it's a good governance structure. When I've been faced with clients asking due diligence questions, the best clients haven't been asking, you know, what are you doing about cybersecurity? What are the technologies for backup? They're asking questions about the governance structure, and they're really delving into that and saying, well, who are you reporting this to? Um, they're giving scenarios and finding out how you're going to react. And so governance structure is the number one thing to cover. Yeah, I th uh, we've, we've hit the end of our time, but I think you know, that, that incident reporting, the governance piece, we didn't really get, to get into that, but I do encourage you to, to think about um, how firms are reporting incidents, whether that is to law enforcement, whether it's to regulators, whether it's to the industry. I mean, there are some expectations um, in terms of, of not keeping these things secret. Actually, you talked about the rising tide lifting all boats, and so there's a, there's a concept out there. Um, but we have hit the end of the time. One uh, housekeeping point, if you go to the app, there is a survey, uh, cyber survey. So if you get into the menu and then you, I think it says complete survey, if you could just check that out. It's a number of questions and, and that will be you know, good feedback and we'll try to touch on that a little later if we can. Thank you.